Well, I want to preface all that with, uh, so the, the, one of the bigger different, one of the major differences that people misunderstand between a brawler and a karateka or martial artist is the b greater understanding of principles and, and uh, concepts within the construct of combat, right? And a brawler doesn't study anatomy, doesn't study, uh, you know, any physicality other than how to win typically because they're too busy you know, they're brawling they're not practicing so if you're if to be a true martial artist you must study some of these things anatomy or or action reaction position structure anatomical or uh, or even mental or emotional position um with regard to the uh, that's that's interesting uh the 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 four or yeah the eight 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 positions uh that uh, Mr. Wedlake's talking about. It's really interesting that there's eight because the universal pattern has eight basic angles and you have eight basic angles of attack and you got, you know, all that whole universal pattern baloney. And I forgot what the question was, Mr. Uh, Casey. Well, what do you do with the feet? What do you mean? What do you do with the feet? Well, you have four positions with the hands. What about the feet? Well, you, your feet are. <laughs> I'm sorry, your, your Lee. Feet, you didn't bring that up, funny. so I figured, what the heck? I throw it. Your out. your oh. your feet are somewhat limited, but they also <laughs> tie in, and and you have to understand the the proper positions and the proper place for that. I mean, that goes back to structure, right? Your everything structure is starts at the feet and at the ground, and if you don't know how to root to the ground, and if you don't know how to uh, be in proper placement, at, you know, he mentioned bracing angles you know, uh, and, and angles of alignment and all of those things, you know, when we talk about uh, backup mass and we talk about um, uh, torque and rotation and, and making things, and then you talk about timing, all of those things are reliant on structure and position and alignment. Uh, you know, Marty, your thoughts on uh, what these two men have just said. <clears throat> I wish I would have went first. <laughs> it would have been easier. <laughs> Uh, body mechanics to me is, is working as, as one unit. And, and you're correct. I like what Mr. Gergen said, you know, starting from the ground up, you have to work on that structure. And, and I'm a firm believer in, in keeping that structure there. I, I believe that we don't teach the beginning student as my own, my own thoughts here. I don't think we teach them enough on how to look at the body mechanics and, and to look at Kempo, what, you know, it's a study of motion and we forget to do that. Sometimes we talk about it, but we don't really delve into it. And I do, I do agree with Mr. Wedleg saying, you know, at the beginning stage, you're just trying to get them to move and have, have a, a left and a right foot uh, and the hand movements. I get it. Uh, I think a lot of that needs to be pressured more from the instructor to really start working on the basic body mechanics on how to move properly. And I think everything else will start accumulating from there. In our moves, we're learning that. The, the ideas are there from the basic yellow all the way up in our basic techniques. But I don't think we stress enough on, you know, putting a little bit of pressure on it too to make sure that under that pressure, that success ratio can raise up a little bit more too. Uh, as far as a brawler goes, you know, the brawlers like to fight just out of fighting. I mean, they're going to come in there and, and it doesn't matter what it looks like on the street they're really not going to know we're doing Kempo at all. You know, you better have your game and you better be ready to take a good blow and make sure that, you know, whatever you do, you can pull off and end up being the, the one that's still vertical. You use a, you were inferring to pressure. That's something that you like to use pressure test uh, techniques and concepts and principles, because that's the real deal. It's sort of it is trial a real deal. and error, so to speak in scientific terms. You know, it, it coming up from where I came up, we came up under the Labonte lineage under, you know, Mr. Labonte and Mr. Kelly. And if you weren't knocking the lungs out, they didn't really care, you know, if you had the, the technical aspect of it. Uh, and at the time, I knew no better. You know, and it was just be tough. If you can't punch his lungs out, then you're doing something wrong. If you end up on the ground, you better get up because it's going to get worse for you. Uh, I do believe as I evolved and learned more about it, and it came from, you know, the planets you know, teachings to me is, you know, starting to learn about the, the finite details 
on motion and how to look at it and make what I had even better and take it to a higher level. The pressure testing, I, I'm a firm believer in that. In order to get the highest success ratio you can out of your body under stress, you better put it there because how you do anything is going to end up how you do everything. And if you don't put it in that situation to look at the, the maximum efficiency from each motion you're doing and then under pressure, see how well it held up, then I think you're missing a, a big uh, element of it. Let's go to Lee. Okay, Lee. You uh, explain under coordination, you use an acronym of CNS. Can you explain that? It's your uh, central nervous system. Okay. So what you're doing through repetition is you're um, building neural pathways in your brain. So when you, as you do repetition, there's a, uh, a compound called myelin that helps to um, improve those connections with neurons and axons in the brain. So it, it allows you to recover information more quickly and to fire what needs to be fired in order to do something. So by practice, constant practice, you know, it's the old perfect practice makes perfect, not just practice makes perfect. You could be playing the piano like this and it's calling it practice, but it's not getting what you want out of it. Um, so you need some quality practice in order to ingrain these things so that as Marty was saying, your chances of success are higher from that sort of thing. Pressure testing comes in a lot of ways. And uh, I was reading a book recently on combat handgunning for, for street, for surviving gun battles. And they said, if you wanna train somebody to be in a situation that's they're likely to occur on the street, you have to go out on the range with the student crack him upside the head and then see how well he shoots. Well, you can't do that for safety reasons. And you know you can't do that with most of your karate students. I mean, you've got your roughnecks out there. Mr. Parker told me, he says, you take those guys under your wing, those are your, the ones that eat nails. And uh, Frank was the same way. So you can't do it with everyone, but that's taking the pressure testing up a notch. You define in your CNS, you say the fine motor skills, the gross motor skills, and then the hand-eye uh, coordination. Can you get into that a little bit for us and explain how that applies using uh, from your central nervous system? Well, you know, everything's tied into the CNS. You know, so it's got to get a signal when it says, do this, do that, step this way, block like that. Uh, you've got to coordinate the upper body with the lower body. That's the purpose of your forms is to get the timing because the lower body moves more slowly than the upper body. And then you have your fine and gross motor skills. The fine skills are the first ones to go out the door uh, under stress. And this is why you see those classic movie scenes of the person trying to open the lock with the key and their hands are shaking because their fine motor skills are shot. So in the Parker system, we spend an awful lot of time working on those hand formations, doing the finger set and beating the student over the head about formation, bracing angles, angles and methods of delivery. And uh, gross motor skills are the things that are developed, like when you're just playing punch in the bag and under stress, the body has certain uh, stress reactions that shut down some systems so that other systems can function better, which is the old caveman response, the fight or flight sort of thing. There's more to it than that, but that's really the difference between fine, gross, and then you got your hand-eye coordination. You, uh, in your writing that's coming out, you discussed a little bit about what happens if you don't do certain things. You injure parts of your body by failing to execute it in a correct manner. I'm trying to lead yes. you into what you wrote. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you noticed that. <laughs> my, uh, my first teacher really didn't care much about how well we did something. And so what I found is that uh, being young and enthusiastic, you like to throw those hard spin kicks into the bag. But if your upper lower body time is not right, you can hurt yourself. And uh, people hurt their hands. They hurt their knees and their elbows because they're punching with the elbows locked and so on. So um, we need to, as instructors, to know the anatomy, to know the kinesiology and step in and make corrections so that somebody can do this for a long time, that they don't just get out there and 
overextend, hyperextend, hurt themselves. I remember Paul Gerard sitting on the mat there at Pasadena one day because he'd been kicking the bag or something and he jacked up one of his toes. He sat down and he started cussing. And he says, I've hurt myself more here in a studio than I ever did on the street. <laughs> That's funny you say that. I remember one time, and I'm going to Todd next. I was, uh, Frank was always pushing uh, a front snap kick, a rear step through ball kick to the, to uh, the opponent's groin or midsection. And I, I, I tried really hard to get that. And I fought this one guy and I kicked him and I bent my front toe on my right foot all the way back. My foot turned purple from the tip of my toe up to the instep of my foot. Scream bloody murder. And I said, I am never going to do that kick again. I don't care, Frank, what you got to do in there. And so, Todd, how do you address some of these things that, um, that, that Lee was just talking about? Well, it's funny because, um, you know, I got this cool uh, classic anthology of anatomy uh, I've flashed a couple times now. It has like just a myriad of volumes of uh, different anatomical things because, you know, it, it initially it started with me wanting to know more about the anatomy so that I could have a greater effect, right, as a martial artist. But then in, in time, as it should be, in my opinion, you know, I wanted to know more about it so that I could impart that information to my students and help them so that they don't hurt themselves. I did a seminar one time <clears throat> out in Seattle, and I had a couple of a uh, couple of uh, uh, physical therapists in the class, uh, um, husband and wife team, I believe it was. And I was teaching lone kimono, and in lone kimono, there's there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Well, actually, there's a thousand wrong ways to do it, and a thousand right ways, or one or two right ways to do it, without hurting yourself. And what I see most people do is they'll they'll trap and they'll raise a stiff arm and this will if you do that too hard this will tear your rotator cuff this will blow your shoulder out people you know this is where we get into structure structure and anatomy if i come up with a bracing angle and i'm bracing that from an anchored position and then i rotate into that that's a completely different action and a completely different application of the physical anatomy on somebody else and in, in, a, in a different application of the muscles and the joint and the ligaments and all of those things in the shoulder that completely and entire and utterly stop us from injuring ourselves through that single action in lone kimono. Lone kimono is a great technique unless you do it like this. Um, and so the reason I brought up the seminar was I was I was teaching the seminar and I brought this up and I made a point to teach this in the class said do not do this this way. Um, and, you know, and explain why. And at the end of the class, it was interesting to me because I'd never had any affirmation on this is right or wrong. I'm not a doctor, obviously. Um, these, uh, this couple came up to me afterward and thanked me for pointing that out and going through that process of helping people understand that there is a right way and that there is a wrong way so that you don't injure yourself. So yeah. it was... Uh, Perfect. You know, it's funny you say that. Did you get anybody pushing back on you on that? No. Nope. All? None? Nope. I remember one time I was nope. teaching a class, a seminar down in Florida, and the group was there and they asked me to recreate Friday night class in Pasadena. And so we were doing that. And, you know, it was a heavy in, uh, coverage of basics and then some of the techniques out of four. And I remember there was one of the students that was there, it was a third degree black belt, and uh, they had a very deep stance like Taekwondo. And I mean, it, it stood out really obvious compared to everybody else. So I grabbed a staff and I showed them and they said, well, I feel really comfortable doing the stance this way. And I said, well, if you look at the, any of Mr. Parker's writings, you will see in it that he had a very closed stance for reasons that were intended. Obviously you guys can explain that. I said, your analysis or, you know, your, the way you're, you're, explain this to me it's sort of like somebody that smokes do you do you smoke and they said no i don't smoke well the problem is if you were to smoke you wouldn't think it was bad until 30 years later when you have lung cancer okay well this is what's going to happen you're going to find out that stance is going to be to your detriment at the wrong time marty you